So I'm Nancy Eckert. I'm a systems analyst, web developer, and project manager from uh, the University of Washington. Uh, I am a brand spanking newcomer to information security. I'm largely here because of gaming. So games have been part of human culture for millennia. Games provide unique opportunities to uh, recreate systems that may or may not actually exist in the real world in order to solve problems that do. So uh, maybe you're familiar with uh, social engineering in InfoSec, in the topic of phishing, and you're probably also, uh, um, you're probably also familiar with uh, InfoSec type games like Capture the Flag. Uh, we had some uh, wonderful uh, pr uh, talks earlier today that uh, introduced new types of InfoSec games. So hopefully this is not uh, a strange topic to you. Um, humans have always played games to learn, socialize, and exchange information. It's the exchanging information part that we're primarily concerned about here. So I'd like to open this talk uh, with a quote from Charlie Strauss's keynote uh, from the 30th 4th uh, Chaos Communications Congress in 2017. Someone out there is working on it. It's a geolocation-aware, social media-scraping, deep-learning application. It uses a gamified, competitive interface to reward its players for joining in acts of mob violence against whoever the app developer hates. Probably it has an innocuous-seeming but highly addictive training mode to get the users accustomed to working in teams and obeying the app's instructions. Think Ingress or Pokemon Go. So I've been playing Ingress for about five years. Uh, I'm a champion strategist, raid leader, and community organizer for the Pacific Northwest. My weekends are uh, composed of uh, uh, fighting armies of anywhere from a few hundred to a thousand players uh, competitively uh, in real time. And uh, I'm here to tell you that actually uh, Mr. Strauss was not that far off the mark. So before we begin this talk, I'm going to very briefly just give a general overview of this game for context. This is not a pitch uh, or uh, to install or play it, although if you do, make sure you pick the green team. So what you need to know. Ingress belongs to a family of augmented reality games, or ARGs. It has a few key characteristics which are relevant to this talk, which I'll ask you to keep in mind as we start talking about swarm intelligence and human systems. The game is played in physical space in real time. There's no pause button, it's always on. The get competitive game involves going to places that are in some way challenging to access, which can sometimes require special equipment, skills, or intelligence. There are two opposing player teams. It's directly adversarial, PVP. Two teams compete for the same resources in a capture the flag type format. It is a fixed sum game. Big points are scored in the game through high trust operations involving the precise co cooperation of dozens to hundreds of people. Uh, geographic scales involve uh, ranging from a neighborhood to global operations involving international cooperation. Oh yeah, just as a side note, this game also has a built-in surveillance component. As you probably guessed from the previous two slides, most in-game actions are reflected on a global map and a communications log both of which can be observed by other players. One of the emergent effects of this game was that the players eventually developed a browser plugin to plot players in the map on real time. That's right, this is a game where we all spy on each other. So trust is a big thing, obviously, and so is cooperation, and this is what I'm going to talk about today. Okay, back to theory. Any game theory uh, uh, fans in the audience? Yeah, okay. Everybody familiar with the, uh, uh, the prisoner's dilemma? The stag hunt, maybe a little bit less well known. Okay, well, I'll just give a very brief overview then. So, these are two classic problems in game theory. Um, the first one, the stag hunt. It did both, both of these have to do with cooperation. Uh, the stag hunt basically postulates that there are two parties, uh, hunters, that uh, can either choose to go after small game or big game. Uh, big game is harder, it requires cooperation. Uh, and uh, just, uh, just to let you know, um, one of the assumptions in, this, in these models is that these parties cannot communicate with each other. This may actually become important uh, later on. So uh, in both of these games, uh, each party has an opportunity to cooperate or defect. Um, 
in uh, the stag hunt, uh, cooperating uh, uh, yields higher rewards. Uh, lack of cooperation does not necessarily uh, uh, penalize you personally. Um, however, uh, it does penalize your the other party. Um, the prisoner's dilemma is very similar. However, uh, the payouts are changed a little bit um, in which uh, there, there is a motivation to cooperate. Two prisoners are uh, uh, placed in solitary confinement. Again, they are not able to communicate with each other. And they are given an opportunity to uh, basically give, provide information or rat on the other, uh, on the other uh, prisoner. Uh, if both of them end up uh, defecting, uh, then, <coughs> pardon me, if, both of, if uh, both of them end up cooperating, they end up with a much lighter sentence. If one cooperates and the other defects, uh, then the one who, uh, uh, the one who uh, defects um, does not actually get pun uh, punished. However, the one who do uh, cooperates does. So these two problems in game theory have been brought up in um, uh, many, many different uh, situations. Uh, ultimately, what we are trying to say here is that there are, uh, these are, are situations in which people might have a benefit to cooperating, but may have perfectly logical reasons not to do so. Um, if we think about it, we can probably come up with uh, a lot of real-world uh, uh, real world problems that can be expressed in terms of a prisoner's dilemma. Um, maybe one would be, suppose you're a security research and you want to give your client the best advice possible, but maybe you're not quite sure they're going to expend the effort to implement your recommendations. Uh, and you don't want to waste your efforts. So you basically have to make a choice. How much work are you going to put in when you're not sure you can trust the other party? If you both defect, you both lose. So games, and unsurprisingly, real-world situations, they can devolve into a prisoner's dilemma if trust is not built. One of the very real criticisms of uh, game theory um, modeling is that humans, like cats, they don't always behave according to neat, neat mathematical models. For one thing, you can know that it is to your advantage to cooperate and, again, still have very good reasons to not do so. Uh, especially when we are together in groups. We can sometimes be persuaded to act against our own self-interest. This, after all, is what social engineering is all about. However, social engineering, as we know, it can be used to build as well as disrupt systems. Ultimately, difficult tasks require cooperation. Sometimes they need organization. So the great question is, how do you get intelligent, free-willed individuals to cooperate? How do you get these people to act as a team? So augmented reality games, MMOs, as well as any organization, particularly volunteer organizations, uh, are concerned with how to herd these cats. And there are a lot of strategies that begin with a single question. Who's in charge? So when we're building an organization, this is often the first system that we try to build. It's a pyramid. It's a very intuitive structure. So yeah, you have your founders at the top that are calling the shots. This is where most of the valuable information uh, in the system is kept. Information flows from the top down. Uh, near the bottom of this pyramid, you have, um, you have the, the rank and file. Sometimes these are end users uh, in game terms. A lot of times they are new players. Uh, sometimes they are casual players. Uh, so there is also this sense that uh, if you are at the bottom of this pyramid, you want to be at the top. Uh, and you know you have this is your individual goal, which may or may not align with the team's goal. So this approach has some strengths. Um, is it anybody have any ideas of what what some advantages to this pr approach might be? That's absolutely true. So uh, yeah, if you have uh, one person who uh, makes an error in, the, uh, in the, the lower tiers, it does not necessarily propagate to the rest of the system. Uh, particularly in, in emergency situations, uh, chain of command is very well understood. Uh, it answers that question of who's in charge very decisively, which can be invaluable in certain ad hoc situations. Yes, that's absolutely, 
Yes, that's correct. So you have uh, maybe the person at the apex of the pyramid need not concern themselves with uh, all of the day-to-day -day operations of what's going on uh, elsewhere, only the parts that they are personally uh, um, associated with. So there are also some disadvantages to this approach. Uh, anybody want to want to guess? Yes. <laughs> the person at the top might make a stupid mistake. Yes, because that never happens. Yes, from the back. Yes, bandwidth. The person at the top cannot process that much data. Uh, p uh, uh, eventually they will run up into a situation where there is just too much information for them to process. Yes, absolutely. The person at the top may, may assume that everything else in the system is working correctly and uh, that faulty assumption may, may lead to errors as well. Yes? Ah, so uh, we, we have uh, a problem identified with information flow. A lot of the infor uh, most important information that is being observed by the uh, bottom of, of this pyramid may not necessarily flow to the top. Yes? Yes, cross cross communication is uh, is suddenly very difficult. Uh, sometimes, you know, somebody on on this side of the pyramid may need to know something on the other side of the pyramid. And if your information flows from the uh, bottom up and then to the top down, maybe that won't happen. Yes, one more. Absolutely, the single point of failure, and as in fact, that's that's something that I'd like like to talk a little bit more about. So, uh, what we all seem to be saying here is that this this approach, again, it's very intuitive, but it also lacks flexibility. Uh, it lacks the ability to adapt to changing needs. Uh, when it encounters challenges outside its wheelhouse, it tends to break. Systems analysts refer to this as a brittle system, and uh, these problems tend to only get more pronounced at scale. So what we know about brittle systems is that they are fairly vulnerable. So just to flip our perspective, literally, we haven't changed anything here about the system. We're just flipping our perspective. And we can see that the entire structure rests upon that single point of failure. The apex of the pyramid is also the choke point. Choke points are very well understood in gaming. They are catnip to offense. Attack the, uh, the choke point and the, the greatest this, pardon me, the single greatest point of failure to do the most damage. There are many, many, many strategies are built around this concept in InfoSec and out of it. Uh, spear phishing and social engineering, where uh, this one part of the system is targeted, is one example. You, know, uh, you could send IT support to fix the computer in the CEO's office, bypassing all of those other layers of defense. Uh, these are all variations of attacking the point of greatest vulnerability. Okay, so those of us that are tasked with defending the integrity of the system, whether we're playing a game or not, this is a real concern. It forces us to think a little bit more creatively about how we design our systems. So here's another metaphor. What if we could do something like this? So at first glance, this appears to be kind of an unintelligent mob. These are starlings in a murmuration formation. In actuality, there's some crazy teamwork going on here. This is what swarm intelligence is. Now, this is not a new concept. It's used widely in programming, and uh, it, this is not accidental. Just as artificial neural networks are patterned on our understanding of how the brain works in the natural world, artificial swarm intelligence in computing is patterned on observed behaviors in the natural world. And it isn't just birds either. Fish and insects do it too. So fish, schooling for defense, uh, Army ants as well, solving complex problems through cooperation, adaptive specialization, and communication. They make rapid decisions through a kind of consensus building. But what exactly are they doing, and can we emulate it? To 
to use a programmer's analogy, they're following a set of very simple instructions. They're, and they're processing information from typically their nearest neighbors. So from a security standpoint, this is pretty interesting because attacking one part of the system doesn't really do a whole lot. Since the swarm doesn't need information from the leader or the entire swarm, removing any one node here merely establishes a new nearest neighbor. It has this quality of resilience that resembles a self-healing organism. So examples in the human world, there are many. Maybe you know of some. Uh, I've got up here the simplest example is a flash mob. This is a spontaneous, not really spontaneous, pillow fight we see here. Uh, can anybody uh, uh, maybe think of any other uh, examples of uh, uh, systems in the human world that maybe have a, uh, are swarms or have a swarm-like quality? Yes. Emergency, yes, emergency, um, uh, e emergency response to a fire, yes. Yes, that's, that's, that's one I hadn't even thought of. Uh, um, a wave at a football game uh, it, it sort of grows organically out of maybe a, few, uh, s a small portion of um, the population's uh, desire and coordination, and then it just sort of picks up steam. Yes, in the back. Twitter, <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Social, me yeah, social media uh, definitely uh, has a lot of uh, swarm-like qualities. But yes. Political manifestations. Uh, I don't know about. Uh, I. That's a challenging. That's a challenging one. I can think of a few political uh, political situations and movements that definitely have swarm-like uh, capabilities. Um, anonymous, perhaps, or maybe even QAnon. Um, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yes, the stock market. You have uh, um, it, something that is not necessarily uh, uh, controlled by a central authority. Uh, yes. Ah, yes, Tra traffic patterns where, uh, um, again, the, the sort of end nodes are all influencing each other. Exactly. Um, I'll just name out a few uh, others here. Uh, let's see here. In the game EVE Online, uh, the appropriately named Goon Swarm, <laughs> uh, famous or some would say infamous for rolling over their competition uh, with armies of newbies. Uh, the software company Valve, back in 2012, uh, described a very swarm-like structure in its employee handbook. Uh, which was uh, famously leaked, uh, encouraging employees, employees to form their own small teams and take initiative wherever possible. Uh, another one, the Swedish Pir Pirate Party, um, installed several members in Parliament with a very swarm-like structure, uh, famous for a three pirate rule, which basically said if three members of the Pirate Party think it's a good idea to do something, they would be backed by 100% of the party's treasury. Amazingly, they never had a problem. Uh, Another, <laughs> another one, um, Al-Qaeda, actually. Uh, General Stanley McChrystal um, uh, wrote a few books on this, um, but uh, he, he fought Al-Qaeda in the 2000s, uh, described, described their decentralized organization as something the US military um, actually had to emulate in order to fight effectively. Uh, what he found was that uh, uh, timely solutions tended to emerge from the bottom up, rather from the top down. Lots of examples. But what is swarm intelligence? So we're defining it here uh, as a set of strategies for organizing complex cooperative human systems. Uh, a more general uh, definition would be the collective behavior of individuals operating more or less autonomously. So there are still leaders and there are still influencers in this approach. Uh, however, uh, it is decentralized. It does sort of break down this, uh, uh, that pyramid model in favor of a more dynamic structure. So swarm intelligence strategies leverage and empower the entire network, not just the people at the top. And so a lot of the traditional management structure is replaced in favor of a more ad hoc leadership and autonomous collective action. So one of the most desirable qualities of this swarm intelligence framework is adaptability. These strategies can be applied to several different scenarios. They can integrate quite well with uh, more traditional uh, hierarchies, such as the pyramid that we just talked about. And it offers solutions that uh, compensate for many of the challenges that, uh, they that, that they encounter. It's flexible, it's robust, and when it's done well, it's an incredibly fast and efficient uh, way of coordinating large groups. So to reiterate the qualities of a swarm and why we might want to use one, flexible, 
Uh, it reduces overhead, uh, reduces reaction time by elimin eliminating a certain amount of bureaucratic overhead. Uh, it's resilient. Uh, it reduces surface area for potential attacks, uh, enables that self-repaired um, uh, repairing quality, and uh, a lot of times it will even overwhelm the competition with greater resources, whether that's time, money, or interest. And it's effic efficient. Once again, it uh, leverages the skill set of the entire swarm. So how do we do it? So the first thing that we'll do is we establish a win condition. I'm using game language here since that is my background. This is sometimes called a vision or a purpose. This is the reason your swarm exists. Uh, and then basically you break it down into first principles. Uh, you have to break down your, your skills into uh, first principles that can be mastered, and this is important, autonomously. Uh, if uh, you, you have a leader in the organization, you need to be able to free, o free their bandwidth for um, other high-level high tasks. Uh, so the more that you can actually, uh, the more that you, you can actually have your swarm do things uh, autonomously, um, the better off you are. Uh, the third one, of course, is communication. Um, one of, the, uh, one of the, the things that makes the prisoner's dilemma and the stag hunt um, problematic is that uh, none of the parties are allowed to communicate with each other. Once you start introducing uh, this idea of communication, uh, we start to see solutions appear. So it's not enough just to make sure as a leader, if you, uh, if you are, are managing a swarm, to give people all of the information you need. What you're actually trying to do is get people to talk to each other. But why? So when individuals acting autonomously have strong purpose, mastery, and communication with their nearest neighbors, collective intelligent behaviors will emerge. They're not always the behaviors that you expect. In some cases, they're not necessarily the behaviors that you want. However, this is, this is the minimum, uh, minimum conditions uh, necessary to catalyze uh, collective intelligence. And a lot of times, if you're trying to solve a hard problem, such as defensive security, um, you are going to need to uh, trigger that collective intelligence among your, enti your entire group. We can actually break it down even further here, uh, make it even more universal. So to catalyze swarm intelligence in a game setting, here's our general equation. Play the game, talk to each other. Play the game. This is breaking skills down as far as possible to first principles that can be mastered autonomously. Uh, we call this unconscious competence. Again, it is the minimum condition necessary to unlock swarm intelligence. The swarm needs to be able to do the right thing by default. The more we can do on, um, autonomously, the more mental bandwidth we have for focusing on higher level tasks. So again, game is a metaphor here. It does not have to be a literal game, uh, although we will see in a moment why it might be. Uh, all this is is just a uh, metaphor to describe the activity of your swarm. And talk to each other. The simplest foil, again, to the pr prisoner's dilemma is to allow the prisoners to communicate with one another. Communication needs to be fast and efficient. Uh, it needs to support the team. Again, it is not enough for the uh, apex of the pyramid to tell everybody everything they need to know. You need to get uh, everybody speaking to each other. So ultimately, what we have to do for this is establish trust, which mm, is not always easy. A lot of times, that c this can mean using a common language to optimize communications. If you've ever listened to hackers or tech people, experts, or highly skilled individuals in, well, any industry, you've probably noticed that a lot of times we have our own language. This is how we identify each other. This makes language a very powerful tool for uh, social engineering, for inclusion as well as exclusion. Uh, the other uh, piece of sort of talking to each other is a feedback loop. Uh, this, this goes into the uh, cross-communication need. Um, you have to uh, establish a healthy environment for feedback uh, and be utterly fearless of criticism. So uh, one, one of the things that we tend to do in these uh, high-trust operations in the game, uh, success or failure, uh, we will do a thorough debrief with the entire team uh, and find out what worked well and what, what could be done better next time. This is absolutely critical. Here's another metaphor, it's a party. So the lifeblood is of a swarm is recruiting and retention and trust. The best way to do this is to deliver a worthwhile experience for everyone. Uh, so 
this could be a literal party, or it could be some other kind of worthwhile experience. Uh, how you want to deliver this worthwhile experience is uh, different with every swarm. Part of the social engineering challenge here is becoming fluent in a swarm's goals, what they consider to be a worthwhile experience, and tapping into that. That is to say, you have to do research to figure this out. You have to do recon, just like when you are uh, researching uh, in any other social engineering target. Uh, your goal uh, through all of this will be to build trust and identify reward. Again, when we're doing this, there are two main chemicals that we're actually trying to activate in the brain. The first one is oxytocin, which is fundamental to trust and bonding, and the other is dopamine, which is, uh, controls our reward centers and defines what we think of as a worthwhile time. As human beings, we have discovered a few uh, very reliable ways to activate dopamine reward centers in the brain, and maybe you can think of a few. The one that I'm thinking of right now is gaming itself. So games have a built-in win condition. This is what games are. Uh, games remove obstacles uh, for communication by providing opportunities to take risks and show vulnerabilities, for better or for worse. Games have been shown in many cases to be reliable than just about any other motivator uh, to get people to act for or against their own self-interest. So when we create games that uh, that promote mastery of these skills, we're also reinforcing the swarm's win conditions, and we're promoting communication by establishing, uh, by, by establishing trust. So again, this, uh, this is what social engineering is all about. So when you are building trust, whether that is to persuade people to act for or against their own self-interests or the interests of the group, when we're successful at doing this in group situation, what, what we're actually doing is building tribe. So by leveraging the problem-solving capabilities of the entire swarm and facilitating that critical cross-communication, you can truly make a team greater than the sum of its parts. And uh, just to go back to reference the uh, quote from Charlie Strauss, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. Thank you all very much. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Are there any, in, in, in playing the game and being good at the game, are there, are there common vulnerabilities to, like, to, to win and to lose with or against? Uh, or does the strategy of the game change very drastically over time? Like, are there known, known tricks and known tradecraft? Or does it learn so quickly that you have to keep, keep up to date with how, how you win, so to speak? That's a, a great question. So this is a game about, or a question about ingress itself. Are there known vulnerabilities? Are there, there are tricks that we use against each other? Absolutely. Um, I would say, although it is definitely a, a, uh, a dynamic game with uh, different strategies according to game format, um, there are a couple of uh, sort of persistent uh, issues. One of them is operation security. Uh, this is a game in which if you know what your uh, opponent is doing, it becomes uh, very easy and in some cases trivial to thwart their plans. Um, another one has to do with, again, trust. Um, uh, and again, this, this goes into operation security. Um, what's the best way, way to describe this? Uh, a lot of times um, you, you have... This is, a, this is a game that's played in physical space, however, um, a, a large amount of it is done virtually. So we do have a lot of people who uh, maybe are pretending to be somebody that they are not. Uh, so uh, establishing trust by uh, verifying identity and uh, verifying goodwill um, is definitely something that uh, is, is always important in the game. Yes. So yes, I have a problem, and I'm an Ingress player, and uh, anyway, I'm just kidding. The, uh, I, I've been playing Ingress for a long time as well, and uh, w <laughs> the strategies that we ended up with, there's a lot of interesting things that mimic security. So um, for example, <coughs> we were able to, uh, you're not supposed to create portals in areas that you can't publicly access. Somehow we were able to, and so we were able to establish uh, segmented areas, okay? The other thing that we also uh, tracked was when we saw the blue team member, uh, so I'm green, go. And uh, as we saw blue team members coming in, we would notice that, uh, we, we, we would have a buffer zone, if you will. So there are certain portals that we wanted to protect because they were high level portals and we had loaded them up 
you know, they were our crown jewels, if you will, um, but they were still in public areas. And so we created a buffer zone where we knew that they were coming based on the t trajectory of some of these other players as they appeared to take over portals around us. And so whenever uh, we had enough sufficient amount of time to be able to get enough people to thwart any attacks within a given area. So just having some, some a set of defenses um, where you can uh, where you can see attacks coming is a very helpful um, was well a very helpful strategy for us as well. So the way w uh, in the security realm, what we call that is a crumple zones, areas that we don't we are okay if they start getting hit in some sort of way, uh, but we don't want the the crown jewels to get hit. All right. Uh, yes. It's a great question. So the question was, how do we account for specialization in the swarm? There is a wide diversity of uh, skill sets in a given swarm. Um, in general, the, the focus or the, the, the swarm strategy focuses on uh, linking these skill sets together. Uh, now, again, I, I'm a high-level player, however, I, um, for you know, whatever reason, I may not have the bandwidth to monitor a certain area. Um, however, this is also something that uh, somebody who is also very new to the game can also do. Uh, so when a lot of times when we are um, organizing for global tournaments, uh, a, a swarm strategy would basically seek out as many of these diverse skill sets as possible, whether or not they are from you know, new players or veteran players. Uh, again, increasing that cross-communication and basically uh, being able to take advantage of all of those skill sets as opposed to you know, just the ones from the veteran players. And in this case, veteran players often act as uh, mentors and sponsors to the, to the newer players, um, but also um, to identify, catch, and leverage those skill sets. Yes? Yes? Mm-hmm. Ah, yes. So the, the question was about uh, whether um, specialization and uh, I think you were you were speaking uh, about polymorphism in uh, um, in insect col colonies, uh, where um, uh, players or entities or you know be bees uh, actually change them uh, some something about their own selves uh, to um, to meet uh, an emerging need. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, there are in, in games there there is kind of a um, there's kind of a an impulse to think of people as either being oh I'm a, I'm a defender or I'm a builder or I'm a blaster I only you know attack things, however um, a, s a swarm uh, strategy would basically uh, you know leverage that uh, that ability to change to change shape to change function to adapt to um, a new need absolutely. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm Oh, absolutely. Anybody ever work for a company where they, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Happens all the time. 